Welcome to the Procurement Software Podcast, where we aim to educate and inspire you about how technology is changing and shaping our profession. The truth is, there's never been a more exciting time to be in procurement, but only if you're one of those organizations that's embracing the change and driving new developments. And this podcast is all about giving you the tools to help you get there. So buckle up and let's get right into this week's show. Yes. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Procurement Software Podcast. We're the only podcast out there that focuses solely on procurement tech. So as you can seek, choose and implement the right technology for your specific situation with confidence. And we've got another guest episode on today. And this one's going to be an interesting one because I talk a lot on the show about how industry-specific solutions, I think, are going to be the future in terms of really being able to drill down and serve a particular industry or subsector's needs. So going to be talking today a little bit about the oil and gas industry specifically. And to do that, I'd like to welcome Praveen Kalamegam, who is the CTO of WorkRise, who are source to pay solution in this space. So uh, Praveen, welcome to the show. Yes, James, thank you for having me. Great to be here. So let's kick off, Praveen. I always ask this to any guests that I bring on the show a bit of as a bit of an icebreaker. So let's assume that you're the chief procurement officer in a mid-sized business and you have no digital procurement tools in place. So you're the lucky boy that's got a greenfield role and you somehow managed to convince your CFO to give you $50,000 to go out and buy some procurement tech. So uh, what would you go out and spend that money on? Well, I'd take a beat, I think, right up front in the sense that you really need to understand the scope of the problem for the business. Every business is different. And, you know, for some, this is a, a massive part of your PL and it deserves the right attention and focus. Sometimes it's not a huge part of your PL overall. And in that case, perhaps like your investment from a procurement standpoint can be more, more nominal in that instance. I think one thing that I've learned both on both sides of this, you know, in, in, in my organization, IT runs into me as well. And there's a tremendous amount of what this company spends and procures kind of goes through that department. And so I have some visibility from that perspective. But I'm also, you know, one of the employees of this company and feeling the impact of like well-run procurement and the goals that you have in investing there, feeling that from one of the employees and as a user of that. And I think that's one of those places that's highly neglected is that the efficacy of one is something you're trying to implement is largely dependent upon the diligence with which the company can absorb and adopt you know, you're, you, what, what you've invested in. And so I would certainly be focused on that as well. A lot of the newer players, I think, are taking more, a, a more serious look at how you make something, you know, far more intuitive and easier for an organization to absorb at widely. And so I certainly have a bias towards that and those disruptors in the space. But I, again, I think it's, it's really important to, to assess, you know, what your particular needs are before you go write a check. Got it. Okay, so your background is a little bit different to procurement technology in this sense. So maybe it's just to set the scene for the listeners, just give a bit of a, a very quick whistle stop tour of your history. And then I think as a follow on question from that, what made you decide to start something in the procurement tech space? Because this is a tough sector to be in. And when I go to conferences, everyone kind of says, you know, the market's starting to get crowded. So, um, yeah, walk me through your logic behind how you got into the space. Yeah, so I think I was listening to come up a couple of your podcast episodes earlier. And I think you you said a lot of people just fall into procurement. I think I'm in that bucket of uh, having <laughs> procurement found me. I didn't find it sort of thing. But my background is like in technology companies and software companies all up and down software stack. I joined WorkRise about five years ago. And we also were not really in procurement at that time. Our, you know, our business is the largest part of our business and where we got our, you know, most of our size is from solving one category of spend for energy companies, which is focused on labor. And so I, you know, I joined a company that was largely focused in, in, in that space and we were building technology that was, you know, more 
like consultants focus these high, uh, you know, highly specialized skills within the energy space. But, you know, as a company, we evolved and learned that this was uh, like all of the pain we were going through, all the friction we were experiencing as a vendor. Give, granted, a sizable vendor is, the, you know, one of the largest providers of labor in, in energy in, in, in the U.S., we were experiencing this friction, but this is just one spend category. And these energy companies are dealing with, you know, you know, you, you name it, number of categories, materials and tools and equipment and services and all sorts of different areas where they're spending. And labor is just one of those. And so we started to take our experience and, you know, having cut our teeth in this space in labor and turn it around and try and provide a better solution for solving this problem more holistically within energy. So I, I think procurement both found our company, but also found found me as a result of working here. Yeah, and contingent labor, especially high, highly skilled contractors going into the energy sector is, you know, as, as you say, it's a massive spend, isn't it? So absolutely. Why is energy, when we look at, when we focus on what you've grown into now, essentially managing the end-to-end source-to-pay cycle within the energy industry, there are a lot of legacy players out there on the market. So tell us a little bit about why you see energy as being different as a sector to essentially deserve its own niche specific tool and to be able to survive and thrive in that market. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the things that is perhaps not well understood by, you know, lay folk who may not be thinking or breathing in, in the energy space is how massive these capital projects are that energy uh, companies are investing in. They deal with hundreds of different suppliers and thousands of vendors. And, you know, the procurement stage right up front is a critical one and is where a lot of the cost savings could, could come from. But it is just one stage, right? I think of, you know, procurement... If you zoom out from procurement and think of supply chain, I think that's really what are these energy companies when it comes to like how they perceive the problem. That's what they're really thinking about is like, how am I optimizing my supply chain in service of my capital projects? I think if you compare that to, if you compare that to like a, take it like some technology company or how, like, let's just take us, like how we think of shopping or, or handling our procurement challenges. We're really looking at procurement of, you know, vendors and software and things like that to enable our company to function and run. But it's not about the supply chain for our capital projects, right? And so when you are thinking about the challenge of procurement in energy, it's got to be about how you are thinking holistically of that capital project and how you're bringing substantial savings and enforcement of, you know, predictable spend for their projects ongoing. And so that's a little bit different than what, you know, the traditional players might be focused on. Yeah, 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 100%. So if I was to summarize that then in in one or two sentences, it, it would be that CapEx projects are a lot more cost intensive and a lot more complex than they are in some of, even in some other manufacturing industries like you know, consumer packaged goods or something like that. You In oil and gas or in, especially if it's offshore, there's a lot of complexity within the supply chain and a lot of complexity and cost within just the magnitude of those type of CapEx projects that these companies are executing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that while you can do this and many companies do this piecemeal, they try and find what's the best in best in class for, for, you know, for sourcing and what's the best in class for compliance, what's the best in class for, you know, invoice management, what's the best in class for field ticketing. Those systems and those solutions rarely work together. And if they do, very poorly. And if, and unfortunately, that's where most of the savings are. That's where most of the value is going to come from is when you have this connected chain from source all the way to pay, where, you know, just as a, uh, for instance, if, if you're going to, like these costs explode, right? When you think of the quantities used. So even if you're procuring, like if you're procuring cement for a project, you're bidding out perhaps on, on price here and you're, ins- you're, you're wanting to ensure that whatever we agree upon here between my selected vendor, and, you know, 90 to 100 days later, when this actually hits my balance sheet, that those numbers are, are congruent. But along the way, the number of people in, involved in that before you actually are using, calling for and using uh, cement and having that invoice come through, 
you know, that's, that's like 10, 15, maybe 20 people. And the, the likelihood of that actually, you know, staying congruent is through the sheer willpower and, and, and effort of people. And that's where the system should really be doing the heavy lifting, right? And making that job a lot easier for. So that, that just trying to paint a little bit of the complexity of the picture when it comes to uh, energy. Whereas here, if I get something wrong in my, you know, how I perhaps put in a PO or prove payment for something, you know, somebody's just darting across the hall or sending me a Slack message or something like that to, to clarify and cl- clear up things. Whereas here, like no one's going to fly out to the middle of West Texas and drive out three hours from the airport to, you know, to find the person who might be needing, having some critical detail involved in this. Got it. So it, this is a question that I kind of ask everyone when it comes to, when it comes to procurement technology. And, you know, I think it's a, it's one that we as procurement professionals grapple with and get frustrated with oftentimes because we are, as a department, procurement is, a department that spends other people's money within an organization. You know, typically we don't have our own budget other than for travel and expenses and maybe a little bit of training or consulting. So normally we would have to go to the CFO or, or perhaps the CIO to be able to get this kind of investment signed off. So let's just say that there's a head of procurement working in the energy sector who's listening to this. Give me your best shot in terms of being able to pitch this to his CFO or her CFO. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it's interesting because as we have, you know, sold into these energy companies, more and more, we are finding our success in finding like the right partnerships is when we start with the CFO or someone who reports to, to the CFO in that, that area. Because all like Interesting. We, we've even run on our solutions, running with super majors and with some mid to large size uh, operators in, in energy. Like leveraging our solution uh, is saving them 22 to 25 percent. So, you know, when you think of someone at that organization who is having constant, you know, downward pressure on get your costs out of the system, get your costs lowered year over year, someone at that, at that company, at the operator company, if you say that you can save 22 to 25 percent of some segment of their supply chain, that's like assuming you know the other things are are fulfilled around you know safety and you know compliance and, and etc that's a no brainer right or at least like absolutely we need to have a conversation about this and so more and more and more we're like at least parallel co- having a conversation with that department even as we're engaging with you know the procurement slash supply chain leaders in that company and so like as far as how do we help them pitch? We're right next to them pitching sometimes. Now, I, I think it's important to say like these numbers are true for the operators that we ran the study with, and, but we need to prove it, right? And that, and the most of those cost savings come in the form of how we can simplify your overall supply chain. And so it does really take, you know, uh, like an understanding from both of those departments to really realize some of these gains, but they're real. And so we're trying to make sure that comes through in the product, but also, you know, is quite evident in the solution overall, realized on the bottom line. That's interesting saying that you're approaching both finance and procurement at the same time. And I think from just a personal perspective, I think that's a, a smart strategy, certainly in terms of potentially speeding up or accelerating the sales cycle. And you know, as we all know, enterprise sales cycles are and it notoriously long. And it also gives you that insurance, doesn't it? That if, if someone within procurement moves to a different position or, or even leaves the company, that you've got another, you've got another angle in and you've already established a presence in another area of the company, especially ultimately in most cases, the CFO or the office of the CFO is going to be the economic buyer. Yeah. That's, uh, I like that. Yeah, and 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 actually, because again, like kind of going back to the the previous compare the comparison where we're talking about energy companies and their capex projects and uh, supply chain required for their capex projects, like our solution is not a SaaS is not really a SaaS solution. So the our instead of selling software that is a tool to help their like a back office function, perhaps this is a solution to the problem itself, which is they need compliance safe suppliers that are providing certain things for these projects and they need, you know, like uh, enforced pricing and constraints and thresholds. They need, 
you know, confidence that if anything like falls through, that there's resilience in providing, you know, supplanting that with some replacement. And so that's a solution. That's not just the software underneath. And when we sell that solution, that doesn't have to have as long a sales cycle. There's all these like just in time needs. It's interesting. Like these projects are so uh, expensive that if, if you have a delay in one critical, like, like, if, like I was talking about cement earlier, like if you had a delay in some of that delivery, the time, uh, the downtime is costly, right? Cause there's a whole bunch of people who could have otherwise been doing work that are now unable to do that work. So the cost could be like hundreds of thousands of dollars a day lost just by virtue of delay, a supply chain challenge, or if a critical vendor is not showing up at a critical time, if a tank is full and needs to be emptied before we can move on, anything, all of those things are really critical. And so we're building the, like this solution ultimately with the concepts and critical concerns of a procurement and supply chain function, but we're building it for the field of these CapEx projects. And so that that's a, is a really important distinction and it makes it very straightforward for us to, you know, you can try before you buy. You have a just-in-time need, we can, you know, we can substitute for that today. There's a lot of M&A, for example, in, in oil and gas, especially right now, it's very frothy where you see a consolidation of, of various operators into, you know, larger conglomerates. And every time they do that, there's all of this supply chain because there's like, okay, I just bought this company. How do I continue to have these, like, 25 projects in the field running with their vendors now that the rules have changed, right? Now we like parent company rules apply and we can provide the, the liquidity in that time frame or the grease in the gears to allow for you to safely do that. And in the, in those introductory moments with our solution, you're seeing, okay, how could I actually use this more holistically? What portion of my spend can I run in this way? I'm probably going to always keep my like core spend, you know, direct. And handle that directly with my own people. But there's some segment, if I'm able to maintain the same visibility and transparency I expect from my own spend with my own people, maybe I'm willing to, you know, like l- let go of this to this solution that provides me very much the same information at the same level. Interesting. So I'm going to go a little bit off piece to you, but sure. what are your thoughts on some of the more generic products out there? Because you know, energy is an interesting case study here. A lot of digital transformations fail and, and legacy tech in the source to pay space has kind of got this stigma a little bit. And, and one hypothesis that I have is that the solution providers who do niche down on, on a specific industry sector will have a better chance of success for some of the reasons that you've already laid out, you know, in, in terms of the specifics relating to to that industry sector, what you mentioned about supply chains or potential delays being extra critical to a big CapEx project where you know one or two week delay can mean millions of dollars. So if you're not trying to be everything to everybody, and if you can then tailor your sales and marketing and your product to resonate more with prospects in that sector, and ultimately, I guess, possibly even hire people with industry experience in procurement and supply chain to help your sort of sales enablement. Do you see yourself going up against some of the more generic products like Cooper and Ariba and iValuer and and winning out as a result of that? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. You know, I think if we framed the problem as digitally transforming the back office of energy companies, uh, we'd fail too. <laughs> I think it's really important, right? Like we, if we're, and, and, and this is a little bit of the dynamics again, like if you, you got to have to extrapolate this here with me, every one of those implementation, let's say there's, there's 10 operators and each one of them chose one of those companies. In fact, many of them do like use, uh, you know, SAP uh, solutions and or implementations. Every one of those implementations is highly customized to those operation operators, companies. And so I've never heard of a supplier who said, Oh, you also work with SAP. That's great. We're super familiar, right? Like never heard it. because each one is bespoke and built for, you know, for that company, for that operator on the, on the buying side, demand side. So that's, that's the problem, right? So suppliers will basically tap out at some point. They're, they have to, they come to a real decision point. And they tell us this when we talk to them. I have to decide whether I am a, you know, an, like an OFS company, an oil services company, or if I'm a accounting company, because my accounting department has to grow to support all of the variability in these operators implementation, right? 
So that's load that's put on this ecosystem. That's why I keep talking about like we have to solve this for the ecosystem, not for just simply one back office. And I realize that actually is not going to be an overnight thing. And it takes time for for a company to like relinquish and believe that that's possible and that it could be ultimately fruitful for them on demand side. But so kind of coming back to like the supply is tight. Like all these operator companies are operating at almost capacity, right? So that means the supply side of this, they're not hurting for jobs. So liquidity is small and you need to take care of vendors too. You need to take care of supply side too. None of those companies that you talked about really focus. They pay lip service, but they do not focus on enabling and delivering value for the supply side of the equation. It is simply about the demand side. And in a supply constrained ecosystem, that's just not going to work, right? So like with our solution, for the first client that a supplier works with through our solution, yeah, maybe it looks like the status quo. It's a better, it's a better, more intuitive interface. It's more, you know, what you'd expect from one of the disruptors in the space. But the moment they work with client two and client three and client four and realize that nothing's changed. And in fact, we take most of their compliance and vettings and just play it forward. So they don't even have to do any more submission or like, or, you know, the rigmarole of getting, you know, a green check next to your name and in, in, in an, an AVL. That is when they realize like this is a game changer for them, right? This is high leverage for them. They don't have to be an account. They don't have to have a growing accounting function with a growing business. They can actually just grow their business and, and focus on what they're experts at. And, uh, you know, and if you take the from the, you know, again, the value that we're delivering on the demand side is like ultimately as you work with this network, the network is the power. So, you know, a Reba has a network of, of, of vendors, but a network of vendors, which is like kind of like uh, like a searchable logos list and and that sort of thing, and a contact number, is different than a network of engaged vendors. An engaged supplier pool is a much much different beast and a much different thing to interact with. So when our clients, our operators, are able to interact with an engaged network of suppliers you're able to find a vendor that you can have high confidence can go to work next week, right? Because they're engaged and already working either with you previously or with other companies actively right now. And you can see their real time, like how appropriate they are for your position with availability, location, services provided, compliance state, all of that at the click of a button. And that's, that's a really important aspect to how we think that it's going to be very difficult for one of those traditional agnostic, industry agnostic solutions to succeed simply because that's a ground game, right? If you're going to be like, if you're building an engaged supply pool, if you're building services that really actually like pair the, the compliance vetting into that overall supply chain, that those aren't things that those companies are going to be like experts at. They're not going to understand it. And more importantly, I don't think it's wise for them to try and tailor to that level because that type of focus will detract from, you know, what they are trying to solve for, which I think is a different problem. Yeah, I would agree with you there, there that I don't think it makes sense for anyone that's a more generic solution to try and niche down too much. Otherwise, they'll cannibalize their uh, their existing customer base. It's, it is kind of a conundrum for them, though, isn't it? It's uh, luckily not one that me or you have to solve, but it's. Um, right. I think you do hit on a point there that as the market increasingly matures and solutions like Workrise appear in other in other industry sectors, I mean, there already are. You know, you can you can see other solutions out there more in terms of B two B marketplaces, I guess, rather than end end to end suites, but. They're, cer- they're certainly there if you look at things like chemicals or the biotech industry. There are B two B marketplaces out there that, that cover that. You know, MRO. Yeah, it does. It does beg the question: to what extent then will, especially you mentioned Ariba, and I think we have to single them out as the ones that have put in the most effort and spent the most in terms of marketing on really pushing that B two B network. And think, well, where does it go from here if you've got a bit of a, a hodgepodge of various different vendors in there. And okay, it's a massive network, but you're absolutely right. It doesn't niche down on anything specific. So how engaged are those vendors going to be 
in terms of servicing that network? I don't know is the honest answer, but it's a very, it's a very valid question. Yeah, I mean, I think the demand will probably be depend. I mean, the uh, the likelihood of of getting work this way is probably going to be directly proportional to their level of engagement. Yeah, given that you're so focused on one sector, how how do you approach things like partnerships and alliances, both you know channel tech partnerships with with other procurement tech firms, but also in terms of if you've got consultancies that that, that are around digital tra- transformation or operational excellence in that specific industry sector, I, I, I get. I guess be interesting to hear your answer. I suspect it's easier to build deeper partnerships in that sense. Is, is that true? Yeah, it, it's absolutely true. One of the things that I've I've been really amazed and impressed by in the energy industry is is how open they are to to approaching a problem in a unique in a unique way. So this concept of partnerships and alliances is is critically important. We work with everyone from like, you know, small, independent, one rig operators all the way to the super majors. And we have to meet these operators where they are. Some of them are looking for, hey, look, I'm I don't have anything. If I don't use you, I'm using email and spreadsheets. So you know, what do you got? And and for them, we can build something or not build, but like they can leverage this solution to manage their, you know, their approved vendor lists and to really handle like invoicing and the whole kit for them. And for super majors, it might be like, look, you know, we're obviously not coming from zero. We have a tremendous amount of investment in some of the, the more generalized solutions are implemented. You know, and there are other, there are other like SaaS products that are focused in energy that solve like one portion, like maybe they solve invoice management or maybe they solve field ticketing or maybe they solve compliance, right? And what we offer is something that connects the whole chain, but we obviously need to be able to work seamlessly regardless of if they want to continue to use one portion of that the way they are today. And so I think that's, we kind of fill the gaps. And we're there if you want to actually connect the full chain, but you don't have to benefit from the value that we are, that we are positing to present. You know, one of the, one of the, like, I think what we think of as like the overall, like five why problem for the industry is ultimately one of trust, right? Like, you, you know, you want to have trust from, you know, the moment you're engaging and handshaking on what we agree we're going to do together all the way to you've done the thing and you're getting charged for it that hand like that handoff going through you know 15 20 different people across like maybe 6 months that's hard to like have a handshake scale to that level but the oil and gas industry is an is a handshake industry and so our product is basically trying to solve that underlying 5y problem of trust through transparency and that transparency comes from this connected chain. So we try to meet them where they are and solve the most acute problem they're facing today. We never try and sell the solution to the chronic problem because no one's going to buy the, the whole thing. It's like, yes, I believe it's trust and let's buy this uh, this big, big, big thing. But if we can solve an acute problem and meet them where they are and work with the, the existing solutions that they are actually happy with and then start to introduce the ways in which we can fill more of that transparency gap, I think that's where we see the most uh, the most success. You know, it's a really really interesting space. One of the things that you were talking about just there that uh, that it just peaked in my mind when you asked the question, it, taking a little bit of a different slant on partnerships and alliances. There are experts in this space in running some portion of projects or even entire projects on behalf of operators, right? Because like they really have a, a deep network. They have an uh, an incredible sophistication and understanding how to run effective and efficient programs and projects. And so we've actually started to to work with them. We've worked with some of them closely for years and and we're starting to expand our partnership in in enabling them to successfully build for for those energy companies. They do it really, really well, again, by skill set and sheer force of will. How can we support them with a solution that actually does some of the heavy lifting and plugs into a larger program for that operator? And that's something else that we are seeing a a great deal of success in in partnership. Yeah, thanks, Praveen. I was curious about partnership specifically because I'm a big advocate of it. And I think it's very underutilized channel, particularly for procurement tech SaaS companies. They're 
a lot of them don't really utilize that. So um, yeah, I was curious to to get your answer. So I'm just conscious of the time and looking to to wrap this up. So I've got two quick fire questions that I want to ask you before we sign off. Don't think about them too much. It should be okay. spontaneous answers. So number one, if you could live anywhere in the world and money were no object, where would it be? You know, I've I was just I was just talking to my family about this. I've done the math and I've gone to beautiful places. I think it's here. I'm a little bit of a homebody and this is home. I've been here for over 20 years in Austin, Texas. And uh, I think it'd be here if I needed to be here for good. All right. Very uninteresting. That's the truth. And then the final one. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's the stakes, isn't it? And, and the final one is what's your favorite guilty pleasure? And the only rule here is you have to keep it clean. Ah, uh, you know... It's it's sweets. <laughs> like I know sugar is terrible for me and I cannot resist a great dessert. I went to a wonderful restaurant, one of my favorites yesterday, and uh, I promised myself going in that I wouldn't have dessert, but I guarantee uh, you would not you would not be surprised about the result. I was eating uh, uh, like a, 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 a smattering of different <laughs> different desserts by the end of it. So indeed, willpower is finite. So where is the best place that we should send anyone if they would like to learn a little bit more about what you do or connect with you? Absolutely. Workrise.com is everything about us. Uh, you'll see uh, more articles about uh, the things that I just spoke about today and all of our social contacts are on there as well for keeping up to date with us. Super. And we will link to that in the show notes. Praveen, thank you for coming on. Great to talk to you. And, uh, and yeah, learned a little bit about oil and gas today. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, James. Okay, so that was Praveen and that was WorkRise as a industry-specific solution to all of your end-to-end source-to-pay requirements in the energy sector. Just a quick one before we round up. We are increasing the number of tech maps that we have in our store. So if you want to go and have a look at a bunch of pretty logos all on one place to see which particular players serve the specific primary category or size of business that you're looking for in your search for the right procurement tech partner, then just go to store.procurementsoftware.site where you can download all of those completely free of charge. Thank you very much again for listening and we will catch you again same time next week. Until then, bye for now. 